Hi everyone, good morning, evening, afternoon, middle of the night, um, wherever you are. Although I don't have to say middle of the night because I don't think Alan's on, so it's okay. We're all we're all in normal daytime mode, I think, today. Um, Alan, if you are on, sorry, still the middle of the night for you. Um, so, hello to everyone. Um, loads of you from, where are we? A lot of, a lot of you from the US today. Um, and those of you that are actually in England have worked out that it's still snowing in May. Um, so I don't get that either. Uh, if anyone else knows what the hell is going on with that, then please let me know. Um, but there we go. So um, welcome to the next hour, um, as always, of Capture One Editing. So we're going to be going through your images. So you've sent in images for us to have a look at, and we will try and edit them as best we can. Um, this is designed to be an interactive session by nature of the fact that you can put in comments. Um, so as we're going, please do heckle, um, comment. I might not be able to respond to all of them. Um, but if they're about Capture One or about that image, then we'll try and uh, talk it through. So, as I say, put all your comments in as we go. Remember, please, when we're streaming, there's about a five or six second delay, maybe a little bit more, between me saying something and you seeing it on your screen. So by the time you've typed your comment, I'm already maybe moved on. So just bear that, or bear that in mind. I'm not ignoring you. Um, we're just trying to catch up. Um, so Brian's saying, how is snow in May not unusual? Brian, where you are, snow in May is good. Um, where I am, snow in May is weird. Um, but, well, hopefully, hopefully that changes. I'm, I'm coming to get you at some point. Um, so, Capture One. Uh, for those of you that don't have version 21 of Capture One, that's the version that we're going to be editing with today. Um, for most of you that are still on version 20, if you are, then version 20 is perfectly fine for carrying on with most of what we edit. Um, there'll be a few little um, differences and we'll explain them as we go. But version 20 or 21 is going to be easier for you to follow along with. If you're on a previous version, so version 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, whatever, um, you're going to struggle with some of the stuff that we use. So just bear that in mind. It might be worth looking at upgrading. If you're on 21, please make sure you're on 21.1.1. Or if you go to the About box in Capture One, it'll actually say 14, which is the version number. Uh, point one, point one. That's the version that's the latest with bug fixes, with corrections, with all the other stuff um, that's the latest version of Capture One that's out there. Speaking of which, before we actually go into Capture One, um, we're going to just cover off another thing. So on the Capture One, uh, I think it's Creative Lab page on Facebook, um, some of you have seen already. Um, there's a bit of a, an opening of arms to say, have a look at the beta. So beta slash beta, depending on where you are in the world and how you pronounce it. Um, Capture One, as you know, has a beta version. So I'm going to say beta just for consistency. Has a beta version that you can apply to access um, and you can apply to use and get early, um, early access to some of those test pieces of software. And that's the key thing. So for those of you that are interested in doing it, and you'll have seen it announced on the Capture One page, um, lots of people have been doing it for many years and they've got, got quite a lot out of it, but just bear a few things in mind. So number one, to get onto it, captureone.com slash beta. Um, you have to log in with your account and you'll get um, a form to fill out um, requesting access to the beta and you will either be approved or not. That's step number one, you might not be approved. Step number two, you'll be able to access, if you are approved, test versions of software. And please, 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 people, remember this when it comes to using beta software. A beta piece of software is designed for the coders, the developers, to be able to send out things that are broken to test. For the general public or general users to be able to test things and see if they work. Which means, if you are running the beta version of the software, expect zero support, zero. You might find a bug that lots of other people have had and it gets fixed very quickly and whatever, but you cannot expect Capture One, and this goes for any software company as well, in, in fairness in that sense, you cannot expect them to be providing you with live support for a beta piece of software. Number two, do not ever use a beta piece of software for a live production environment. And we've heard this happen with studios around the world. Oh, man. Um, <clears throat> they've either moved onto a beta piece of software and they've upgraded some catalog stuff or whatever. And then they found out that in the live version, that's no longer compatible. They've lost everything because the beta also times out. So after a certain period of time, the beta will stop working, as all betas do and then you lose access to the things that you've done. So again, remember, just have that mindset. 
The beta is there for you to get a sneak peek in some ways of what's coming along, but primarily for you to test things and break them so the developers can fix things that they know are likely to be broken in that software. If you're going to sign up to the beta program, don't do it if you have no intention of feeding back issues. That's the whole point of the beta program, is to let Capture One know the problems that you found and any issues that they need to fix. And then the final one, the contents of the beta. And this is the one that unfortunately trips up so many different people online. If you are in the beta program, you will have signed something called an NDA. Now that NDA is a non-disclosure agreement, which means you are not permitted to discuss the contents of any beta. So we can talk about the program, we can talk about the fact that it exists, but once you've got access to that software, you may not share images of it, you may not um, discuss it with other people. That's the whole point of a confidentiality agreement or a non-disclosure agreement. So genuinely, if you think that you can add value by accessing early pieces of software to try stuff out with new functions and new features that may or may not end up in the final piece of software, which is the other little little chestnut with it, because sometimes a new feature doesn't make it into the final, um, final cut, then by all means, sign up to that beta. Great. The more people that test this stuff, the better. But it's not production software. It should not be relied on. It will time out at a random point in time. And the onus is on you to get the best out of that program by providing feedback. So please, you know, as I say, sign up if you can. Do, do it. Um, if, if you've got the time and a spare computer or a spare setup that you can use, but don't rely on it as production software. And, and please don't look at it as a badge of honor for, um, you know, ooh, I've got the new piece of, of software or whatever. Trust me. As someone who has broken many computers with many different software companies' um, beta versions, um, that badge gets very rusty very quickly. So there we go. Um, that's my sort of off we go um, for beta. Um, Joe's just asked, uh, will the beta run in parallel to the released one? Yes, it will. Um, so you can run the beta software and the, the live release. However, if you upgrade a catalog um, from your live release to the beta release, imagine it like a fork in a, in a tree or a, a branch of a tree, you could end up down a dead end. So it's always recommended to keep a copy of your data um, and use that separately for testing in, in the beta. Um, and Keith, can you be a beta tester if you subscribe on a monthly basis? Yes. Um, so whether it's monthly, whether it's a perpetual license, whatever, Capture One don't mind. Um, they need every type of user. Um, but um, yeah, do do just consider whether you've got the time and the, I was going to say nerve, but it's the wrong word, patience, um, to be running a piece of software that you know is designed to break. Obviously, with every version, and every beta that comes along, they're trying to get it more and more ready for production. But I, I see every now and then comments from people saying, oh, I've just downloaded the beta and I've lost all my work. Well, yeah, um, that's that's where you're at. And that applies to every software company out there that do this stuff. So um, let's move on, although we're going to give the final word to Sharon, which is tolerance. Yes, um, so tolerance is absolutely key when you're on a beta version. So um, sorry, one other question before we move on. Um, Thomas, is the beta version ready for the Mac M1 new processor? So um, in terms of what's in current beta, I'm not sure what the current version has in it. Um, but what I would say is, I'm sorry, you probably can't see that um, writing very clearly because I've put too much on there. Um, but what I would say is anything that is coming down the line will go through beta first. Um, so if you want access to try the, the newer versions of stuff, then this is the road to go down. But don't do it with your real stuff. Don't do it in live. <laughs> so with that said, let's go into live Capture One, real Capture One, version 21.1.1, as we said. Um, so this is a shot from Shane. Um, in terms of um, the images that we're going to go through today, we've got a few um, sort of sunrisey and snowy um, sort of shots. Um, a lot of trees. We've got some trees, which is quite nice. Um, so let's have a look at this one to start with. And, and Shane's question was basically, this is the outer camera shot. It's from a um, Nikon Z or Z6. Um, and actually, from a dynamic range point of view, I'm actually quite impressed with this. Um, so Shane's concern is it's overcooked. Um, you, you mentioned you had a filter on the top. 
Um, and yeah, the filter would have been what I'd have, I'd have added on here in terms of a, a gradient just to um, even up what was obviously a very bright sky and certainly the shadows down here. Um, but, you know, has it been overcooked a little bit? Well, let's look at our histogram. Um, and actually, if we, if we want to be really critical, there's probably a little bit of room on this left-hand side here. Um, so we're on our exposure tab, obviously. Um, this one here is the histogram picture. This is where we spend most of our time, and this is going to give away some clues. So in our histogram, we can see there's a bit of space on the left. Not a lot of it, um, but certainly, you know, we could have afforded to go... Where are we? Maybe about half a stop um, less... Well, maybe even a full stop less. I'm just looking at when we start really hitting that wall. Um, and, you know, we'd, we're in a we're in an okay place. Um, there's still detail in the shadows at that point. So, you know, could we have done it with one stop under? Yes, um, potentially. And that might have rescued this sunshine a little bit. Um, but, you know, am I going to criticize how this was shot? Actually, no, because it's, it's been shot pretty evenly in terms of what's overexposed and underexposed in the shot. So what can we do, though? And let's, let's just have a look at what, um, what Shane um, resulted in in terms of his edit, um, which is this one. There's, there's just a couple of things in here. Number one, I think it looks too murky, to be honest. Um, a little too, um, too gritty. Too, um, it's not gr uh, gritty is the wrong word, but um, it certainly looks a bit grubbier um, than it probably felt at the time. I mean, you, you actually mentioned it was very dark at the time. Um, but I don't like the fact that we've lost all of this shadow work here. And the water here, it looked a lot fresher um, when we are out here um, with the original. So I'm tempted to keep some elements of the original while keeping the shadows in this shot relatively intact. So we're going to start with the original, um, and I'm going to create a new or a clone of the variant. If there's no changes made to the shot, we can create a new variant, and it will be identical to the original. If I want to copy a variant that already has the um, changes that are made in there, I can right click on it and go to clone variant and that creates a copy of the original but with those changes as well. So don't forget you've got two ways of creating a variant in Capture One. One is a new one which goes back to raw, one is a clone of your current variant which takes everything you've already done and saves it ready for the next one. Okay, um, so let's have a look at the first thing that was done um, by Shane um, from what I could see already, which was um, sorting out the horizon. So for those of you that are relatively new to Capture One, um, there isn't necessarily an auto horizon function within Capture One. Part of it is because some of it is affected by lens distortion. Some of it may not actually be the horizon. And I've seen it get it very wrong in other, in other software before. But before we do any straightening, we're going to make sure we've got our lens correction done. Preferably, we found the actual lens um, that was used to shoot the image. If we can't find the actual lens, many manufacturers now embed the lens information inside the RAW file, which is why you're seeing this say manufacturer profile. That is not a worse scenario than the lens. That Finding the exact lens is a great scenario. It, it, it works out pretty well because you're using the profiles that came from the guys in Capture One, and they've, they've actually profiled the lens in the studio. But the manufacturer can send that information in as well into the RAW, and that's what the manufacturer profile is there for. So this means that the data from the lens is already embedded into the RAW, and it's been sent into Capture One when it loaded it up. If you don't have manufacturer profile or you can't find the lens, don't just find a similar one. Stick with generic, because um, the chances are a similar one may have slight differences, and you'll see things like fringing or chromatic aberration and stuff that you weren't expecting because the lens profile is not quite right. So correct lens first, manufacturer, oh, sorry, manufacturer profile second, generic third um, in terms of order. So manufacturer profiles in, great. Um, chromatic aberration is an auto thing that's going to happen. I'm going to click analyze, which actually forces Capture One to look at this image. And for this exact lens on that exact sensor, not just every um, Nikon sensor, it's now analyzed for any aberration that's tried to fix it in the image. Where we were shooting at f11, in this case I've, I've zoomed in, there is a bit of diffraction going on up here. So we're just going to turn on diffraction correction to sharpen up some of those um, softer bits at the edges of the lens. Now part of the distortion correction, you'll see if we go back, we can see we've got the barrel effect going on in here. And then as we move towards 100 or even further, it's correcting for that. So we're going to leave that at 100. 
What that means is now when we go to straighten the image, we're starting from a clean base of the correct lens calibration already being done. So now we go to our straighten tool, which is this one up on the top. If you don't see it and you see one of these three instead, just hold your mouse down on that um, icon and you'll get the one with the little um, crosshair in the middle of the um, circle with the arrow. So that's the one that we want. And we're going to just draw a line from this side of the horizon to right the way through. So even though I can't see the horizon, I'm using the dotted line to actually make sure that we're even all the way along. And now we have our straightened um, shot. Now that's straight according to the horizon. It may mean that we've lost a little bit to the crop. So it's your decision to a certain extent how much you're, uh, you're comfortable losing. Um, but if I look at the crop overall, this straightening does lose a little bit. And that's a, it's actually a good example of why getting things completely straight on your tripod with your camera is a really good thing to do. Um, it doesn't, you know, of course you can straighten it later, as you've seen. We've straightened it by a few degrees. In fact, it's 1.2 degrees. Doesn't sound like a lot, 1.2 degrees out. But look at how much of the frame we're missing, partly because of distortion, but mostly because of that straightening the angle of the straighten. So genuinely try and get it as straight as you can out of the camera on your tripod. Now in this case we can actually afford to move this a little bit down to the left, not all the way down but sort of there. I just want to make sure we're not clipping into here. Press my arrow button um, or hit enter in the case of the crop tool and we've now got our nice straight uh, horizon with our sun out in the distance. Um, just a couple of things that have come up on the on the beta stuff. So uh, Keith, time's not a problem. I'm retired and have tested several beta versions. Um, I was a project resource for online banking and so on. In which case, great. Um, then then apply for the beta program. If, if you think that you've got the time and the uh, the patience um, to do it, then go for it. Um, and oh, George, um, the person having spent most of my time in IT, I can confirm your attention points. Yeah, the beta programs, you know, they, they sound really snazzy and fun. Um, when they go wrong, as in the software goes wrong, which it will, at some point, um, you know, don't shout at anyone other than yourself because <laughs> you signed up to it. Um, and Joe's just saying, apart from the tilted horizon on this shot, um, I like the out of camera. Yeah, the out of camera is a, it, there's a nice feel to it, and I, I sort of struggle here a little bit with the fact that um, what Shane was saying is it, it's a lot brighter than it felt at the time. But my concern is if we darken this too much, certainly to here. It, it loses some of this sort of freshness that's quite nice about this shot. So let's have a look at what we can do instead of um, just doing it sort of en masse. So the first is, let's look at just trying to pull down our highlights. So instead of pulling down exposure, which is going to affect everything, that's literally taking your histogram and moving it left and right. Instead of using brightness, which squashes things. So we've talked about this many times before, but exposure slider moves the histogram. The brightness slider squashes the histogram. So it squashes it towards the brighter area or to the darker area. The result is that you don't push any shadows off the end or any highlights off the end. You squeeze things down into that area instead. Instead though, we're just going to use our highlight and our white dynamic range. And that's as far as I want to go with this. Let me just um, quickly show you before and after. If I go further than this, and this is very similar to one that came um, came up, I think, last week, there is no more data in here. So often we'll try and recover extra highlights um, and the data that's up there. But if I pull down this exposure, we can see while everything is darkening here, and we can get the exposure warning to go away. So it's going to go from being very angry to not being very angry. But there's no more data in here at all. Um, all we're doing is we're just reducing this from 255 down to 209, as it tells us at the top up here as I move my mouse around. So I go from no data in white to no data in gray. It's still no data, but in the, in the meantime, I've lost the feel of this shot. So there's no point in trying to pull back something that's not there. Instead, we're going to work with it. And there's a couple of ways that we can we can do this in this shot. And one of them is to balance out this foreground. We've got this really dark slab here. And this lot here is all really light. So I don't think this was a reverse um, GND, but there's something going on here in terms of the, the light hitting here. And obviously this being in silhouette because it's got it back effectively to the sunlight. So I'm going to create a new layer. And we're going to double click on the layer and call it foreground. 
and I'm going to use our gradient tool. So the gradient tool here, click to start the gradient and let go when I'm happy with it finishing. If I press the M button on my keyboard, so M for mask, we can see what that's done. If I wanted to go further, then I just grab this end and we can push it up even more. With our gradient mask done, so that's not going to affect any of this stuff here because it's out of the gradient. And it's going to affect this here less because it's slowly it's going from 100% applied down here at this first line, 50% applied at this line to zero at this line. So it's going to have less of an effect as it crawls up the image. But with this one, we can pull down our exposure. And that actually then starts to highlight this little pool in here, which is reflecting the sky. So from there, we've now got a bit more evenness in, in the scene, as it were, from that bottom right hand corner. I'm going to go back to my background and I'm going to lift the shadows a little bit now. Again, not a lot. 10 maximum. So what, what we don't want to do is see any of this stuff. Don't do that. Bad. Um, what we are going to do is lift it a little bit just to take the darkness out of these bits down here and leave it with enough texture that we can see there's something in there, but I don't want it to be distracting by lifting it all up. So that's got our foreground quite nicely um, and evenly illuminated. Now what about up here? Well, first off, I'm going to actually split this image and we're going to do it by another gradient layer called Sky. And I'm just going to draw that gradient to go here. So it sort of covers the horizon. One trick, and I've, I've talked about this before, but um, in fact, let's just delete that for now. Um, and I'm going to show you. If I go to draw a gradient and I want it at a specific angle, I can hold down the Shift key and it will go at 45 degree increments as I turn the mouse around. But as you can see, it's really, really jittery because I'm near to that um, center point. The further I get away, so the, the softer that gradient is, the more fluid this movement is and the more accurate I can be. The closer I get down to a really sharp gradient, tiny little mouse movements, and I'm literally not moving the mouse in, in real terms in front of me, um, and it becomes very almost unsteady. So there's a couple of ways of dealing with this. One, just plonk it down and then move your mouse over to the middle part of this where it turns into a rotation tool, but further away from the middle. So the further out I go, the more accurate I can be with that angle. The second, let's just clear that. Start again. So new gradient here. Draw it nice and big. Draw it nice and wide. So remember, it's more accurate when we're nice and wide. But this allows me, look, I can place that middle line pretty much on the horizon there. That's pretty good. And let go. Now I can refine it by pulling that top part down and the bottom part up. So I've got more control over the mask after it's been laid down quite big, and then I can shrink it. So with that mask done, I'm going to press M on the keyboard to make it go away again. Let's just try a quick exposure pull. So yeah. We can probably get away with that, maybe 0.2, no more than that. Um, with this, though, I am going to warm it up a little bit. So not a lot, again, but just up to there and maybe up to there. So I'm adjusting the Kelvin, the white balance, the temperature of light, and I'm adjusting the tint, which is normally to counter a, a color cast and a filter. I know the brand of filter that was used in this shot, so I know that I want to counter it a little bit um, with a slight tint adjustment but it's just to offset some of that um, colored um, differences there. We've talked about this again um, on, on other occasions, but don't allow the, the sky and the water or, or whatever it is below to separate too far in terms of white balance. At the moment, we've got a difference of about 200 in white balance and you know, two and a half in tint. Um, if anything, then the background, we could afford potentially just to warm up a touch more. That'll do us. Um, but just don't allow them to separate too far um, because then it starts to look a little bit wrong. Okay, uh, from there then. Um, one thing that is a little bit frustrating, just a bit, there's this line here. I don't know if you guys can see it, um, but on the edited version that, that uh, Shane sent in, there's a more obvious line along here. And I'm sort of tempted to see if we can somehow um, sort that out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new layer and call it line. And we are going to brush. 
Uh, I'm going to choose a 100% opacity, reasonable size, nice soft edge. And I'm going to brush over this area here. And then I'm going to choose a lower opacity and slowly feather in some fall off from that. And you'll see where we're going in a minute. Don't worry if it looks a little bit of a mess for now. So there's my line um, that starts here. And it's these dark parts that I need to somehow just subtly reduce down. So with my... Um, oh, sorry, I just saw a note from Jeff. Double check the foreground layers. You made the HDR changes on the background layer. Uh, yes. No, the... the um, so the background layer I've used, yeah, Jeff, so yes, we have, um, but that's right. So the foreground layer is literally just this corner here, which we're darkening down physically with exposure. We're literally shifting this histogram down to the left. On the background layer, so for everything, everything in this shot, including all these rocks out here, I want to lift up the shadows and um, pull down the highlights and pull down the whites in general. Um, so yeah, that was that, that's right. Um, that was what I, I meant to do, but good spot. Um, so with our line in the sky, we've got an area up here, um, which is masked off. And I'm going to go to a... Let's try with the color editor first. Let's see if this will work. We're going to choose this color here, this sort of murky blue. And let's see if we can lighten it a little bit. Not bad. So all we're doing is we're just softly... And you notice this is so subtle but it's enough that just reduces that glare. Now, this is actually too much in terms of that lightness at 33. So we're going to back that off a little bit there. Let's get it down to, I don't know, maybe 15 or 16, something like that. That's looking pretty good. Then, next one, I'm going to create a right of line, very descriptive layer. Um, new mask, and it's this part here I want to attack. So I'm just going to draw another mask in here. Nice, soft opacity so it feathers out quite nicely it's all about blending it and with this one instead of the color editor we're going to try the other way which is the way that sometimes has fun with our system um, and we're going to try a luma range so i'm going to go to display mask and i want to include everything that's bright but i want to discount or remove anything that is not those nice white fluffy clouds so let's go to nothing here to start with and we're going to bring it back until those white parts of the cloud start to appear in the mask and we're going to have a nice soft fall off and a soft radius like that and apply now with this mask note, note now not just the bits that I drew over but the bits that are now in that luma range I can go back to my exposure tab and I can pull down the exposure just on those parts now if that's going to start to look a bit wrong just back away from it so don't go down to here looks silly um, but we can afford to pull it just you know maybe half a stop that's about it and all that's done between those two um, pieces is it's just softened it hasn't got rid of the line but it has softened the difference between those two parts and it blends them slightly that's all we're trying to do okay and I think I don't know whether that's come from maybe a cloud that sort of I don't know, stopped it or something, or maybe it's just a whole new weather front coming in, but something's um, something's caused that line. Right, and then where we're probably going to end up is with one final layer, which is top, top sky. Let's call it that for, for the sake of it, which is just a very, very subtle, slightly offset at an angle, because I've already got the dark part here, part of lowering that exposure down um, to the top right. And that's where I'd end up. If we think, and it's again, it's personal preference, but if we think this green is just a bit too much, you know, I guess part of the point of this um, shot is to get that green. But if we don't like it being quite so neon, go to your color editor, go to the basic editor, and just pull down this lightness. Um, you're going to have, and oh, sorry, not on that layer, Jeff. There we go. This is the t this was the time to realize it. Let's go back to our background layer, so we're affecting everything. Um, and with that green, we're just going to pull down that lightness. So this is then up to you as to how green and how bright um, that seaweed or algae is um, in the foreground. But you know, genuinely, that's that's your call, um, not mine. That's where I'd end up. So here's our original. 
there's our final. It's not as big a change as what Shane made originally. So that was Shane's um, first edit. To the right is kind of where I'd end up, um, which is probably a bit brighter, a bit, you know, a bit softer, uh, a bit softer, a bit fresher. Um, but if the point that, that Shane was making was it felt darker than that, then stick with that, Shane. Um, it, it depends if you're trying to create an image that you remember from that time or if you're trying to create something that's a print for a wall that you might need to um, to adjust to make it look artistically more um, or even, I guess, um, than less recollected. If you want to darken it down, put an adjustment layer over the top and, of course, we can pull in our exposure overall um, for the entire image. Um, or we can use the brightness tab. Of course, we can go minus 10 on brightness um, and that will... Rather than shifting again, it's going to just subdue um, some of the levels in that. And maybe, maybe actually that is a little bit better, potentially. There's our original. There's our new. There we go. Right, so a couple of questions. Um, where are we? Oh, quite a few questions. Um, so let's go to uh, David. Can you clone an EIP file? Uh, yes, you... Well, you, you can and you can't-ish. So... What if I wanted to create a copy of this EIP file to send to someone or have as a separate file? Um, let's say this one is called this, you know, Z620, whatever, uh, original. Right click um, and you go to export. Uh, you won't be able to see because it's off the screen. Let me just. Oh, so actually, a few things. Um, so if you want to ever hide your browser, which is the right hand side, go to um, Command B. Or you can move the browser to below um, here. Or we can hide the viewer. And then the whole thing becomes a browser, and then you can see what we're doing. So right-click, um, go to Export, and go to Originals. And then you've got a choice. You can actually, if I, as long as I call this file name something different, so version 2, oops, and export that as packed as EIP, it will save this file as z620998 underscore original dash version 2. So it'll load into Capture One as two completely separate images on that basis. So yes, you can sort of clone an EIP. If you're cloning variants, that's all stored within one EIP. If you want two EIPs, so maybe one with edits and one without, um, that's the way you'd do it. You'd export it as an original um, so that you can uh, you can play with the other one to your heart's content. Um, Sharon was saying, I had a few occasions this week where I shot moving action and after straightening them, I lost a lot. Yeah, um, curl of the legs. It, so one one little trick that helps with that, and it may not help with people so much, just bear that in mind, but if we didn't like how much of this was lost to the rotate tool, you don't have to use rotate. We could actually, let's just reset that rotate, and we could instead use our keystone tool. So if I go to keystone horizontal, and I know that this is leaning slightly that way, I can do that and hit apply. And overall, it's going to effectively allow me to stretch, not to greater extent, we've done this before with cities, but to stretch one side of the shot rather than all of the shots to get that um, horizon straight so we don't lose anything on this side, on this side, and it just pulls that top corner instead. Um, but the, the strict answer is just get it straight when you shoot it, um, if you can. Um where are we? Uh, Van, yes, I like to say the sun is a giant flaming ball of space hydrogen. Yeah, uh, well, you say it's never going to have any detail. It can have detail, but in order to see the detail in the sun, you're going to see nothing else in the scene. So sometimes we just got to accept that the sun is going to be um, is going to be a little bit over. Um, Brian, if I have calculated lens distortion figures, is there a place in Capture One to plug them in for lenses without profiles? Uh, no. Um, short answer. Sorry, Brian. Uh, no, there's not. Um, the, the profile engine is behind all of this. I mean, you, you could, in theory, if you're talking about um, pinch and punch, then using the generic one to a set distortion value would help you. Um, if you know that there's... Oh, no, even Keystone wouldn't apply to a lens correction. Uh, no, short answer, no. Um, <laughs> we'll move on from there. Um, and Paul's saying, can we set lens corrections, analyze as the default? Um no, not really so um the difference is let me just go into this one if i choose generic you'll see that chromatic aberration is automatically turned off the reason is because there's no data for uh, the chromatic aberration so if i go into a manufacturer profile you'll see i had the default as the option 
and I chose to analyze. I chose to force it to redo it for this shot. If you choose the generic lens profile and enable chromatic aberration, the first thing it's going to do is analyze it. So when I tick that box, it's going to force and analyze anyway to create it for this shot. So sort of, I guess, yes and no in that if you enable chromatic aberration on a generic lens profile, it will do an analyze anyway because it has to because it doesn't have any data to rely on other than that. I guess that's... I think that's the answer that you need. Um, where are we? Dan, um, could you do this with the style brushes of Dodge and Burn? Yes, you could. Um, the only issue is, and that's why I showed you the second method, which was to use the Luma range, Dodge and Burn style brushes obviously apply to everything on the shot. So not only would it burn um, part of the cloud or maybe Dodge you know, part of the other side of it, um, it would also affect the sky behind. So you'd also be lightening all of the blue um without without any limitations whereas using the color editor for example um if we go to the line version on our advanced one if i want to make sure that we're only affecting for instance the unsaturated stuff so the gray stuff i can pull this back and it's going to have less of an effect on the the deep blue sky and more of an effect on the gray cloud so the color editor gives me a bit more control luma range gives me a lot more control but if you push a luma mask too far it's going to look out of out of sorts with the rest of the image um lots of questions well, there we go um so jim how do we do exposure blending with capture one we don't um we do two things so number one we rely primarily on the high dynamic range that the camera um, recorded. So if you've got a camera that records a lot of dynamic range, then please use it. Um, so use those HDR sliders if you need to, or the exposure sliders, or the curves, or the levels, um, to pull all that information in. The second uh, is using a plugin. So something like Photomatics. Um, we actually demoed it oh, a few months ago now. Um, I'll try and find the thing and put it in the, the link. But um, there are there are plugins that you can you can take your um, under, middle, and overexposed um, in Capture One, develop them, send them to the plugin, it will merge them and then deliver them back as a TIFF. Um, but within Capture One right now, no, there's there's no way. Um, Keith, good question. Do you think the ND grab was rotated to the Do you know what? I've done this. Um, I haven't got one to show you. I, oh, genuinely, for everyone, everyone's sake, because um, people tend, seem to, everyone seems to do this once in their life. Um, when you've got a graduated filter in front of your camera, as someone who has done this before, um, you put it on, you set it right, and then you think, right, I want to do a portrait shot. So everyone then turns their camera around and forgets that the GND has also turned um, to 90 degrees. I don't think it is in this case. I think there's something going on up there with the light on this cloud. It might be a, I don't know, a separate layer of cloud coming in underneath. Sometimes we just get weird shapes that we weren't expecting um, in, in the clouds, but... You know, I don't think it is in this case, but yes, I have done that before. Um, yeah, so so just just bear that in mind. Um, right, and then Roger just saying, I'll just heal a random transition between light and dark to eliminate the line. Not a bad shout, actually, Roger. So um, let's just have a little look in here, because all we're looking to do is try and break up that straight line, right? So what Roger's saying is, let's just create a new heal layer. And with our healing brush, the little sticky plaster at the top, um, let's make it nice and small. Make sure you're at 100 on both opacity and um, flow. And we can choose to take maybe a bit of this brightness and paste it into there. We can take a bit of this darkness and paste it into there. And it will try and blend in. You know, this, it may not be perfect, but it's going to try and blend in some of this cloud. And you end up with slightly breaking up um, that, that sort of line. I guess the question is whether or not the line is meant to be there or not um, whether it's natural or not but that's the way to do that yeah absolutely so if you've got a completely straight line you could um, use a heel layer just to what what not to do is to try and blend the whole line in you'll just end up with a wider line take a staggered approach and just get some randomness in there um, as, as Roger said okay um, where are we Claudius says oh there we go um, and the other answer so ever since I've switched to capture one I've not felt the need to blend exposure yeah nine times out of ten you can do this with recovery most modern cameras have a lot of dynamic range use it see what you can get with um, out of out of the HDR tools if you need more 
I'd question to, to some ways why. There are certain circumstances, shooting interiors when you need to see the outside of a window, you need to blend. Um, so there are certain things like that where it's important. But a lot of the time people are doing it because it's just become automatic rather than just using the dynamic range in the camera, which can look a bit more natural. Um, right, so let's have a look at our next one. So Pablo um Torres del Peña, 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 whatever. Um, loads of people say it different ways. We'll go with Peña, Peña, uh, Torres del Peña, as most people seem to call it. So, um, very, very still water. Um, I've, I've been there and not seen it this still um, before. So, you know, <laughs> very good conditions on that one. Um, first off, let's go to our lens. Um, in this case, it's loaded in the lens profile. Great, which means my chromatic aberration will be for that lens profile, but I'm still going to go to analyze because I still want it to do it for my lens on my camera um, exactly. With that done, um, we're at f16. There is likely to be some elements of diffraction at the edge here. So let's just turn on diffraction correction. Yep, yeah, we get a bit of sharpening um, at those sides. F16 is not a bad choice in this case. Um, you, know, you, you need that depth of field if you want to get some of the detail down here in the water as well. If we didn't need to and we just wanted the mountains, you could get away with F8 on this shot quite easily, but um, it is at 16 and that's fine. Um, so let's move on to our faithful exposure tab and think about what we want to do. At the moment, this is the highlight of our shot because it's a big dark blob in the middle of a, a smooth um, area either side of it. I kind of want to reverse that. If I'd been there at the time, I'd, I wonder if I would have got two GNDs. So I've done that trick quite a few times with you know one at the top, one at the bottom, um, leaving the middle um, empty effectively. So let's have a little look at um, a way of doing that. So let's first off, um, in fact, we're going to do it slightly differently. I'm going to use a radial gradient across this middle and I'm going to go really really wide and really really soft so again just like the linear one the bigger this gap between those two areas the softer that gradient falls so the the more transition the less obvious that uh, the line is going to be and with this one we're going to pull up shadows now here's a problem I'm pulling up shadows on the mountain but it's not doing that it's pulling it up from the outside the reason press M on your keyboard the um, radial gradient defaults to being dark on the outside or 100% on the outside and zero in the middle. If we want to switch that, we can right click and go to invert mask. And now we get the opposite. So now with my shadow pull up, we can see it. In order to get a little bit wider even, we could go even further out there and we could even actually pull this a bit wider too. So all I'm doing now is just playing to see how much shadow detail we can get up just in this middle part without affecting, press the M key so we can see it, without affecting the peaks of these mountains and without affecting this foreground here. So that's, we'll call it um, mountain shadow. Right, top of this shot. Let's um, put in an extra layer called sky and sky linear gradient. And because I want it to be straight, I'm going to hold down the shift key and it's going to force it to be at 45 or 90 degree increments. Because it's going to be straight, it doesn't matter where the midpoint is on here. Um, but what does matter, and what is interesting in this shot, is we've got a little bit of a weird offset that happened there. And someone mentioned that happening before. So this shot is actually straight, but you notice I held down the shift key and it didn't quite get it right at 90 degrees. A bit odd that. I need to have a little little investigation at some point. Um, but we're just going to fix that up for now. Cool. And with that, we're going to pull down our exposure in the top. Again, not a lot. Just enough to make it start to disappear as it goes off the frame. And then another one called foreground. And this one, again, soft gradient all the way up, so really soft in this shot, and pull that down a bit more as well. Now I've made this whole image go darker, and the reason is because I've started setting up for what I want to do on the overall shot. So I've got a half stop reduction in the foreground, roughly a half stop reduction in the sky at the top, and a shadow lift in the middle. So now I'm gonna go on to filled adjustment layer, a new filled adjustment layer. 
with that adjustment layer, we're going to say overall changes. Because it's a filled adjustment layer, everything I do on this layer is going to apply to the whole image. So with this layer, we can now afford to pull up brightness. And that brightness is going to make everything come to life apart from half a stop at the top and half a stop at the bottom. Ignore the weird police car, it's not coming for me. Um, so effectively, I've laid the foundation for what we wanted to do to lift the whole scene up later on. Now, if we look at the mountain shadow and think actually it's a bit too much in the middle, well, of course, we can pull that back down a little bit too. Or with that mountain shadow, if I think actually it's enough in the middle, but this is too dark at the sides, well, let's go to our brush and let's show our mask. And with our brush, I'm just going to start painting. It's going to say, do you want to rasterize the mask? Yes, I do. Rasterize means it's going to take it from being a gradient into something that's painted. And with that mask being rasterized, I can now add more onto these bits at the outside that might have tapered off a little bit. There's a second thing happening here, which is the stuff that's on the outside could be lifted on its own without effect in the middle by using the black slider. So remember, Shadows is going to lift up everything on the outside as well as the stuff in the middle. The middle's bright enough. If I pull up black, it's just going to pull up those darkest areas and only on the area that I masked. Cool. So from there, let's go to back to our overall changes. Um, and now with this, we can afford probably to pull in our levels a little bit just to lift up that white point. So the point that is 255 is now no longer 255. It's now 239 and it's being stretched up. So anything that was 239 is now 255. We're going to leave the shadows where they are. There's no point in lifting all those shadows to then use levels to try and pull it in again. Um, it's counterproductive. But what we can do now is play with white balance a little bit and we can have a look at whether this looks nicer, a bit warmer or a bit cooler. And I'm sort of in a place where that cool light is really nice. This is sort of starting to look a, a sort of blue hour just as the sun starts to set in those mountains. We don't want it to be too or overly pink, but I do want to pick up on this golden color. How can we do that? Well, let's try our color editor. So remember, this layer has everything masked because overall changes. And with our color editor, I could go to basic and choose it, or I can go to advanced and choose this color here, it's that reddish pink area. There's nothing else in the image that is that color. Uh, maybe down here, we'll have a look at what effect it's going to have. And we can push that saturation up a little bit and the lightness up a little bit, just to highlight on that color there. That's looking pretty nice. Um, I'd be tempted on this one just to switch it to a one by two ratio so we can get a bit more panoramic. Not a fan of things getting bigger as they get to the edge. On the right hand side, we can't avoid it, but I'd be tempted to make sure it finishes there on the downside. Um, and almost to there. This is feeling a little bit off level, just a touch. Yeah, then maybe that's better. Um, and then we end up in a pretty good place. So again, before and after. If we don't like this toning, not a problem. It's just on that overall changes um, layer. And we can obviously warm it up. We can cool it down so we can go back to maybe up to there up to you but that's all we've done so we go from there to there there's a few layers in there but it's not massive changes on each one um, each one's a small increment um, just to get a little bit more detail in the shadows a little bit more color punch on that sun that's setting there um, and just to cool it down let's have it look like a mountain right um, let's have a look at um, Ray's shot so Ray's question was how do we make this more 3d um, well, we could sculpt it is one <laughs> one option, um, but I know what you mean. So this is this is a I, I think from memory this is actually a um, shot on a phase one. Uh, yeah, it's an IQ. It's an IQ four. So the level of detail in this shot is going to be incredible. I'm hoping nice and sharp. Yep, excellent. So um, really, really cool details. Every single leaf and whatever. How can we get this to really, really stand out? So this is actually. Ray's, um, so this is the original, this is Ray's edit, the crop. I like the crop on it. Um, I'd like a little bit more foreground. So I, I'm going to go to an unconstrained crop, um, which may make you a little nervous. Um, but 
you know, even if you ended up at sort of three by two, I like including this cloud up here, giving these trees a bit more headroom. But this just gives me a bit more breathing space towards the tree, a bit more foreground, so I'd not just hit smack bang with that subject the first thing I see. How do we make this more 3D? So I'm not going to change much on here, to be honest, Ray. Um, you've, you've done the elements that you wanted to do. You know, you've, you've added in some structure on the trees. But one way to make this really stand out is actually with our faithful color editor. So you've already used the color editor um, to boost some saturation in the cyan. Um, and also to boost the saturation of this yellow, um, which is obviously affecting the tree um, and also the foreground. But what we could do is really take that sky and really separate it out. So I'm going to create a new color um, segment here. And we are just going to broaden it out, have a really soft, smooth, so fall off. So it's, it's going to naturally fade off towards the purples and towards the green, so it's not a harsh end. And I'm going to pull the lightness down. And I'm going to pull the saturation up. So again, they're subtle changes, not too much. Don't do too much of this. But we can go off and on, and you can see the difference. So how do I get that to pop? Well, the issue is, at the moment, it's very yellow, but it's against quite a neutral background. It's a very washed out blue. If we enhance that blue, and you can see the difference, it was a, it's a small change but it really does make that tree stand out more um, just by using the color editor. And the reason we've added that soft or the smoothness onto the color editor, if we set this back really harsh, in certain places you'll see there are sort of lines that start to be drawn as the color is included or not included um, in this range. By setting the smoothness really wide, it's almost like casting a net wider on that color range to affect more things. Um, so you get a very soft edge on the corner. If I really want to bring the viewer's attention into that foreground, we can do the uh, the fun time tricks. So foreground, some of you will know exactly where we're going with this. So nice little gradient, soft gradient, really important. A soft, soft, soft gradient, even if it goes off the screen like it is here. And with that gradient, I'm just going to use our skateboard and pull that exposure down. So now I'm starting to lead the, or the viewer into that tree scene by just using light. So we're just using the, the, the slight darkening of the foreground to do that. Um, we could darken out this out, our background out here, but I don't think we need to. What we might do, uh, though, however, up here with this cloud is add a bit of contrast. So I'm just going to add a new layer, call it cloud. I'm going to put our contrast up. And with our contrast tool, so nice soft edge again, low opacity, so I don't want to overdo it. And we're just going to add a bit of a feel of extra punch into there, just to lighten this corner up. If I don't like that, we can just back down the opacity on that layer until we find a level that we like. But to me, that's where I'd, I'd go with it. Um, it. Out of camera array, it's a good shot. Um, it, it's, you know, it's exposed well. It's composed correctly in, in terms of um, where your subject is. Um, handy little cloud there on the on the top left. In terms of making it more 3D and stand out a bit more, we've just got to get the differential between this tree and that background to be greater. And in this case, saturation and, and darkening down those blues will work. If you really want to push the viewer to be looking up towards the tree, then put in an extra gradient there. If you want to even out this top, then we've also got a, um, let's call it sky evening out. Sounds like we're taking the sky out for the night anyway. Um, so another gradient in here, again, soft, 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 soft gradient. So you'll see I draw a big gradient and then push it off the screen because I really want it to be a really, really soft blend. Um, and with that, we're just going to pull down the exposure a touch there. And that's just to level out the sky from here to here. We could do it with the uniform tool, um, with the skin tone tool in the color editor here using uniformity. But if I know it's just slightly darker on one side and not on the other, then a quick gradient is going to do that anyway. And that's that's where we go. It's a nice quick one. Um, so yeah, there we go. And if anyone wants to see how cool <laughs> some of these images look when they're done in ultra high res, um, yeah, pretty neat. So uh, let's go on probably to our last image for now, which is Bart shot. So some some snowbound trees. Um, question was, you know, whether we move this to be um, uh, a bit more uh, black and white or, or so on. Um, oh, sorry, I missed a couple of questions. 
Um, sorry, I missed that. So, Ray, Clarity on the Mountain. Um, oh, sorry, you meant on Pablo's. Oh, I, I do apologise. I went back a bit too far. We can. Um, we can add a bit of Clarity on there. To be honest, I quite like the feel that it's already got, but if we want to really punch it, um, let's just go and create a new layer, Clarity Mountain. Nice little brush. Um, bit smaller than that. That's good. Let's put up a bit of clarity up to maybe 30 or so. And we're just going to paint on. Again, don't go off the edge of the mountain. Don't go off the edges. You can see where I have it at the moment. And we're going to be erasing that. So a couple of things. Number one, don't go off the edges. If you do go off the edges with clarity, you're going to find some halos start appearing. So try and neaten them up if you can keep within the mountain. Number two, if you're going to do it on the top, do it on the reflection. It doesn't make sense that the reflection doesn't match the subject. Um, and with that, so let's just do without. And with, you'll see it's a subtle change. Yes, it does make a um, an impact, um, but it's that's up to you. Um, where are we? Um, Michael, I'm guessing, was saying about raise one cropping to get the dust spot out. I didn't actually notice, but yes, we can get the dust spot out of um, the previous one um, just by cropping, or we could have fixed it too. Um, so any sharpening or structure? No, um, I'm presuming, um, Jan, you're on about this one. I wouldn't add extra sharpening on here. If you over sharpen something, you end up with extra lines. Um, uh, Brian, complementary colors. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's the way that um, we can make things start to um, start to work um, quite well together. Um, right, let's just go very quickly because I said we'd start on Bart's. So we've got a couple minutes, um, so let's just try and just do the one quick change that I'm going to um, do on here. Um, so I actually, um, so this is Bart's edit um, already here, and he asked about using dehaze um, to to maybe uh, make this um, a little bit a little bit more punchy. I'm going to come from a different angle, which is actually using. Um, a mixture of a bit of contrast, a bit of clarity, and with a brush out here, nice and soft, soft edge, um, reasonable opacity, and I'm just going to make this background here pop just by drawing. So really, really rough mask, horrible mask drawing. Um, but we can just really make that background start to pop. Be careful again, you'll notice I went over the sky here. Look what's happened, a bit of a halo. So you won't notice those things if they're on the subject, but once they get into the sky or any clear area above, you're going to start to see them appear. So we, we're going to erase that and make sure the mask stays within your subject. But look at that difference already from there to there. It starts to come alive. Um, in here, we've got a little bit of darkness going on in this corner. There's a lot of vignetting, actually. The temptation would be then to use a gradient to try and fix all this stuff, but actually a lot of this is from the lens. So on the lens itself, we've got a light fall off option and we can lift up the edges to get rid of any natural vignette. If there's still any left, not a problem. Let's just create a new layer. We'll call that one uh, clarity. It's clarity and contrast that we used. This one here, right hand side. And we're just going to put in another soft little, well, we're in a gradient day today, I think. Um, soft little gradient, lift up those shadows because that's where they're sat. Um, we could even lift up some highlights a little bit, but certainly we're going to use our brightness just to make it lift up as well. Um, and you get to the place, I think, where you were trying to get to um, already, Bart, which is um, just trying to lift the image and get some more detail in the background. And, and you go, um, you get into a pretty, you know, some of these changes are already there, but to really make that background pop, you don't need dehaze. Dehaze is going to potentially get rid of some of this fog, which is actually really important. Instead, Go for the use of contrast and clarity together, which is really going to make them stand out. Um, you're going to get quite a spike in detail across that side. Um, let's just turn that off so you can see what I mean. Without and with. That's just lifting the whole thing up. So if that was the, the intended outcome that you wanted, um, it would be those two tools that I used rather than, um, rather than dehaze. Um, Francois, to darken the sky, would it be possible to br bring the highlights down in the color balance tool? It would, but you're at risk of then starting. Uh, we're talking about um, this shot here. It would, but we're at risk of um, changing effectively. Um, you'll see a slight color shift if we do it in the color balance tool, potentially, um, because this isn't strictly up in the highlights. It's sort of in the upper mid tones. 
Um, you can see on the orange line on the left hand side, it's not quite up there. So we'd have to be playing with mid-tones. That's going to affect other stuff in the image as well. I'd, I'd just be tempted to do it with a gradient in this case. Um, small brown fox. Um, interesting name. Uh, what monitor are you using to color grade? Um, so I, I've, well, I've used and tried loads of different ones. I've tried them from ISO, from Bank, from, from other people. Um, but right now we still use the Apple XDR display, um, which is ridiculously cool. I love this screen. Um, I, I hope to never have to leave it. Um, but for now, um, that's the one that um, does it for me. But with different profiles loaded. So when we print, we switch into a different um, profile space on the monitor. That's the most important thing. It's not necessarily, don't get me wrong, monitor choice is important, but getting the right profile onto that monitor is even more important too. Right, um, so that's probably our lot for today, everyone. Next week, we will start with um, Claudia's. Actually, we're going to have a choice of Claudia's images. You can decide next week which one we start with, uh, the sunset or the city, your choice. Um, but in the meantime, um, for the next week, we will be online on that Facebook group as normal um, for any questions or, um, I don't know, questions, issues, um, annoyances, questions about how to join the beta program. Really simple, capture1.com slash beta. Um, and also remember you've got access to all of the YouTube pro tips, which are the 20 minute segments that cover each of the individual tools. Um, we'll try and, uh, add, as I said that a couple of weeks ago, we're adding more into there, um, coming up. Um, but between now and next week, remember that you can upload more images. Um, so pori for live.wetransfer.com, send in your EIP. I showed you how to send an EIP just in this session. Um, so send us your EIPs. Remember to include your name. If you don't, we can't include your image. Um, so send those in ready for next week. Next week will be the same time. So Thursday at three o'clock UK, whatever time that is where you are. And in between now and then stay as safe as you can, everyone, if you need to, um, or get out there and shoot if you can, and we will catch you next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.